Thanks for staying with us. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We're being joined by Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos, to review the papers this morning. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolawole. Thanks for having me, my brother. Mm. Okay, uh, let's begin with the Punch newspaper this morning. The uh, headline, the major headline is saying, Senate to probe Buhari's government in Mefele over 30 trillion naira CBN loans. The riders are Senate links food security crisis to reckless ways and means loans under Buhari's cabinet. And then panel to investigate CBN's 10 trillion naira anchor borrower scheme, $24 billion forex fraud and others. Your take on that? Well, uh, the kind of move that the Senate is about, about to make in a way is a very strange to me. Why do I say it is strange? It is strange because some of these loans that um, the Senate now said they want to start a problem were actually approved by them. And some of the reasons you find in the Senate today were in that Senate when these loans were being approved. All Nigerian newspapers, the radio, the television, human rights organizations, at that period in time, cried and opposed the approval of those loans by the National Assembly. But all entreated to them to do the needful to stop that reckless borrowing of money or reckless printing of money and spending it, the Senate or the National Assembly turn a blind eye and a blind ear and the deaf ear. You will recollect the incumbent governor of uh, Edo State was the first to raise the alarm that the Buhari administration was merely printing money and spending it and that the consequences on the nation, on the economy, was going to be far-reaching and thoroughly damaging. But the Nigerian National Assembly didn't do anything with respect to Governor Obaseki's uh, outcry at that period in time. Furthermore, they were also beneficiaries of that money in terms of the parasite of office that were provided for them from some of those ways that means that General Muhammad Buhari embarked upon. So how they will now begin to probe, indict, condemn a nature for which they were prime beneficiaries is very, very strange to me. Honestly speaking, I would rather want to see a situation in which the National Assembly and the present government in power at the federal level and at the different state levels and all that who concentrate their efforts on salvaging whatever is left of the Naira and making sure that the economy gets back on track. The history of this country has so, is such that no probe has ever yielded any positive results. Most times, the report of a probe is usually set under the carpet simply because those who should take action on those clues those who should, I mean, on those probes, those who should implement the report of those probes, are themselves usually indicted by the report of those, by the report of all our probes. Take your mind back to since independence. No probe in this country has ever yielded any positive result. It's usually swept under the carpet. And then we begin from zero, uh, from ground zero, or how do they call it? begin to pick about the bush for no just cause. So it doesn't make any sense to me at all, at all. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It's an escapist uh, a way of giving the present government an alibi for not uh, facing uh, serious governor for not uh, uh, finding solutions <coughs> and assuming responsibilities for governance. That's the way I see it. Okay, uh, well... Uh, meanwhile, the federal government blames opposition for food crises on Covers 32 smuggling routes. I, I chuckled when I read that, and you, I don't know how you feel. The federal government is blaming the opposition for food crisis. That appears to me to be another escapist uh, 
uh, argument, if people are smuggling food across the border, what is the customs looking? What is immigration looking? What is the Nigerian army looking? And more importantly, the country to which they say this food is being smuggled to, which is basically Nigeria Republic, and sometimes Cameroon, are countries which borders with Nigeria have been shut down for a long time. And where they are not shut down, the armies are supposed to be or are said to be in effective control of those borders because of the activities against the Boko Haram and then the bandits that are operating in those areas. More importantly, we must remember that the Nigerian Republic, like I have always said, is like a second home to our northern brother. It could be described as an appendage of Nigeria. Why foods are taken from Nigeria to Niger and other places there, you will find out that a lot of goods and services also flow in from Niger into Nigeria. Things like beans, things like onions, and what have you. So if you say you're going to effectively shut that border, the consequence will be you might be generating scarcity, not just in Nigeria, but also in the Nigerian Republic. More importantly, too, it is doubtful whether our brothers and sisters in the north will cooperate with you in, in, in shutting down the passage of food across the border. Because you find out there are some families in, in northern Nigeria who also have an extension of their families in the Nigerian Republic. Almost 70% of the people in the Nigerian Republic speak Alpha language. And those who don't speak Alpha language, they speak for food in full and language. So it's uh, just the artificial border that we have in there. I don't see how we can enforce the strict closure of that border and uh, total stoppage of food from transiting between Nigeria and the Nigerian Republic, between Nigeria and Cameroon. Okay. Um, well, on the on the on the Daily Trust and the Guardian newspaper, and also here on Punch that we are dealing with right now, we we yes. see that um, state police has passed uh, second reading. The bill for state police creation is uh, has passed second reading. But here on the Punch, they say governors to appoint police commissioners. A bill list conditions for CPs sacking. The writer is uh, CPs can't be removed without PSC Assembly's approval. Okay, State Police, here we are now. Second reading, and we're already seeing some parts of this bill. Well, let me quickly say that except there is a mutual cooperation between the National Assembly, the State House of Assembly, between the Presidency and the governors, we may still be far, far away from achieving the objective of having state police in this country. Why do I say this? Recollect that state police, I mean the police, is under the exclusive uh, legislative list, which only the federal government can handle. If you are going to put you on the concurrent legislative list, then you will have to amend the Nigerian constitution. Amending the constitution is not a very easy task. At least 24 uh, of uh, the state assembly must give their consent. And then the national assembly too must give their consent. And then once it is passed from both uh, the House of Rep and then the Senate, then the president can really uh, sign it. So except they cooperate between themselves to give it a kind of accelerated uh, approval at both the state level and the federal level, we may see the very, very far away from it. Then more importantly too, they already started making some mistakes in there, saying that um, it is a police service commission, which I suspect the federal police service commission that will give approval for the removal of state police, I mean state co commission of police at the state level. Yeah. I, I, I beg to disagree with that. The state, once the state police is created, the state should have their own police service commission. 
And it is the police service committee at the state level and the state house of assemblies that should have final decision on who gets approval as commissioner of police and who gets sacked as commissioner of police at the state level. This was the problem we made in the judiciary in which we have the Federal Judiciary Service Commission and then the State Judiciary Service Commission. And we killed the State Judiciary Service Commission by establishing the NJC, which now takes effective control and total control as regards the division of justice and in Nigeria, as well as the management of affairs of um, judges in the country without too much regard for the police service uh, for, um, for the state judicial service commission. If you say you are practicing federalism, you must practice true federalism in the true sense of it. Anything that belongs to the state, they should have effective control of it. Anything that belongs to the federal, they should have effective control of it. Not that you now establish the state police and then mortgage the independence of the state police to the Federal Police Service Commission. And then you turn the police at the state level to a near treatment uh, bulldog. It is not going to help matters at all. I will also want to enjoy the National Assembly not to stop at the police uh, at the state level alone. It must also be included in that bill. Local government police. It must also be included in that bill. Police at the uh, corporate level, if schools in Nigeria, if churches in Nigeria, if some other big bodies like corporations feel that they have the ways and means to establish the police, they should be licensed by the State Police Service Commission to have their own police and then to be killed. All that you require to do is that in licensing them, there is the parameters and training and standards an oversight function that must be made on the police at the local government level and then at the corporate level. Nigeria is too big to be left alone for the police at the federal level and at the state level. In most other jurisdictions, in most other countries of the world, police are even hard at the level of townships, municipal authorities, the mm. collect in those days, Ibadan and Lagos, especially Lagos Island, used to have a very, very effective municipal authority, which was running its own transport, running its own uh, supply of water, maintaining its own roads and water. That is what true federalism is all about. That is where we should go into. So, in establishing the state police, we should also have police at the local government level, and police even at the, at the mosque, at the church, and at the corporation's level. That is the way to go. And don't okay. motivate the police at the state level to the apron strength of the police service commission at the federal level. Mm. But even, even though we want autonomy, we want um, independence of the state police, do you think the recruitment process should be left to the state? Or it should be like, for instance, JAM, <laughs> where you take JAM, but you are going to various institutions. Some people have expressed fear that the recruitment exercise might uh, just reflect uh the 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 person in power the people in power because they will want to recruit their boys you know uh that they use for political gains into the police force so that they can uh get their way with everything get away with everything so do you think the the, the recruitment process should remain at the state or the federal can do the recruitment and let the states run the service well uh I agree that uh, some of these things may be subject to abuse by the governors in the respective states. And we had a little bit of that only the Second Republic, in which the states or the region had a lot of power over security. You find that that whatever party was dominant at the regional level who used the native police under them to create uh, all sorts of malfeasance and have or can make life difficult for their political opponents. Sometimes we read in the books in which the native police authorities will go to the mutuary 
carry dead bodies in the mortuary and go and dump it in the premises of the political opponents of the people at the regional level. And then the same police, the native police with Torrance, go and arrest those political opponents and begin to prosecute them for murder. That is not impossible. We have also seen how the state governors have in the past been alleged or accused of abusing Amatekun, of abusing last month against their political opponents. This is not impossible. But when you also look at the federal level, too many times too, we have seen situations in which the police at the federal level has been used or abused by the people in power at the federal level to harass, detain, oppress, and make life impossible for their political opponents. What we require to do to stop all these abuses is to ensure we provide enough rules and guidelines and causes in the law that we establish in this police so as to minimize abuse. Furthermore, the fundamental rights uh, procedure, enforcement procedure in Nigeria and in our court would have to be strengthened and punishment made stiffer by anybody, by any governor who might want to abuse whatever state police are established uh, under them. I would want to wait or suggest that any abuse by state police or by local government police should be termed as gross misconduct which should be an, an impeachable offense when these policies at the state level and the local government level or whatever are established. All Nigerian politicians have the penchant and the predilection to appease whatever powers are, are conferred on them. It is the Nigerian people across the spectrum that will have to rise up to that challenge and reign in whatever government I want to appease whatever state police is established when this law is eventually a part. Like we have always said, development uh, abuses is only possible when citizens neglect their obligations to be vigilant, to be ready to make sacrifices, mm. to stop whatever abuses. <clears throat> Any person in power may want to piss it on them. That is the way it is done. And uh, it's not law per se. Uh, it's the people who must decide and determine how they want to be governed. After how many are these governors? How many are the local governors? How many are the ministers, the senators, and all that? So if we leave them to abuse our rights, of course they will continue to abuse it, whether at the local, federal, or state level. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to the Daily Trust now. Let's lift a story from Punch and take it to the Daily Trust. On Punch, it says, federal government seeks $10 billion to stabilize exchange rate as Naira tumbles. And then Daily Trust, leading, news, uh, leading headline is dollar hits. Uh, okay, despite federal government's clampdown, dollar hits 1,900 Naira and pound. 2,250 naira to the dollar. The riders are BDC, uh, BDC's raided, operators arrested. Trial and error, not solution, according to economists. Partner us to address volatility, operators tell government. And uh, Nasima wants dollar pegged mm -hmm. at 850 naira. So dollar is now 1,900 naira. Just Tuesday, we were alarmed that in one week, it moved from one. 1,600 naira to 1,730 naira. But in two days, it has risen from 1,730 naira to 1,900 naira. Who knows what will happen at the weekend? <laughs> See, my brother, hmm? my brother, let's uh, take note of what I'm going to say. This guy is not taken. The naira is on the way to becoming another Zimbabwe dollar. Now when you want to buy magic, you want to buy pepper, you want to buy onion, you would have to take millions to the market 
in fact, to buy those items. Why is it so? What determines the value of a nation's currency is the level of productive activities in those uh, in the country. Not regimentation. You cannot begin to dictate how much your currency will be valued. And the fact that all the efforts that the federal government has put in place recently has not helped the Naira. She showed the people in government that regimentation, this uh, uh, quarter master approach to managing a nation's currency will not solve the problem. We have to look at our productive base and ensure that we begin to become more productive. We also must cut down on the cost of governance and all that. All the measures that they are putting in place today were measures that General Buhari tried when he was military head of state. I think it's in 1984 and 1985. It didn't work. He also tried to renominate the Naira at that period in time. It didn't work. On becoming a civilian president, he also tried to renominate the Naira and then also change the color and water. Did it work? It did not work. Furthermore, when a nation is facing the kind of uh, challenges that we are facing, you are having wars in your hands. We are fighting Islamic uh, insurgency. Uh, we are fighting banditry. We are fighting kidnappers and war as well. What such nations usually do is to adopt or go into a war economy in which you streamline a lot of things. Cut down a lot of spending. Look at ways and means in which some of the things that we import, you stop importing them and begin to produce them internally. Look at a country like Ukraine. It's been fighting war for more than uh, one year now with a world power, with Russia. And yet, Ukraine is still exporting grain, wheat, rice, and water. You know. The country also announced recently that it has manufactured a ballistic missile that can travel as far as 750 kilometers and that can hit any time in Russia. That is a war economy. Without a war economy being put in place, they will not be able to do that. So, if this government also wants to cut down and then make sure that Naira gets back its value, they will have to prune down the policies and programs that they want to implement I have advised that this government should just concentrate on agriculture. They should just concentrate on uh, security. They should concentrate on maintenance of existing infrastructure. They should concentrate on THC and power supply. And of course, education. All the other things for now to be put in abeyance until we get it right or until we get the help or until the economy gets recovered its health status. Anything short of that is never likely to be helpful. Furthermore, look at the sensations going on in the National Assembly, going on at the federal level, going on at the state level. For the past uh, six months or thereabouts, all the states, all the local governments are getting good, good money from federation accounts. Has it translated into anything, uh, into any improvement in the well-being of the people at the state level and at the local government level? The answer is no. This is what the government should be looking at. And also it should be paramount to the government that the four refineries that we have in this country, there is no alternative to those refineries. Let's get those refineries working again. Groundwater refinery will not solve our problem. Groundwater refinery will operate like any refinery in Dubai, like any refinery in Russia, like any refinery in the United States of America, it is sell as very competitive international market rate and not otherwise. So, all this Bretton Woods uh, and World Bank and IMF approach to solving the problem of the Naira is never likely to help us at all. Okay, um, let's take this uh 
you know that there, there was a truck intercepted, uh, like we find in, um, in uh, Nature News, Zamfara government intercepts 50 trucks of grains heading to Niger, or Niger rather. So on this yeah. daily trust, they say customs subsidizes, distributes seized food items, uh, partners, uh, uh, media trust. Okay, so now the, 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 the plan is to, to distribute the, the, the trucks of, or the food that was seized to people in Nigeria. And I'm just, I'm just I don't know. Food has been seized. They say it is illegal smuggling, and then they are going to distribute it to Nigerians in the coming days. Five trucks of food. You see, when you embark on the thing, things like a price control, things like banning of a freighting of a food from one place to the other and all that, what you get is kind of a black market. A new underground market will emerge which will now begin to operate and blossom. So that when this problem has solved, it is difficult for you to rein in or to stop those on the damn market that would have become well entrenched and established. So smuggling is an activity, a uh, universal activity all over the world. The solution to smuggling is availability, not banning. Not price regulation, not suppression of uh, people from engaging in their ordinary commercial activities. And then the crude way by which we are going about it, confiscating these items and then distributing them without following due process of law. I'm not comfortable with it. Both government and individuals ordinarily should obey their own laws. Those food items must have been purchased by some people. Mm. They have paid for it. And if they bought those things and then they paid for it legitimately, they are entitled to have those goods supplied to them. If we investigate that the due process has not been followed in the purchases of those items, then you can engage in the kind of activities the custom is said to have engaged in. And not because you have a problem of supplies at home, yeah. then you begin to confiscate and come and there. Yeah, because that's what it my fear good. is. That's my fear because you know, uh, it is coming at a time where government is good. calling anybody who is saving food in the house or keeping food in the house as hoarders. They say uh, you cannot take food outside, you cannot keep food in your in your, in your, exactly. in your barn or anything. So that we don't even know you what really know this what is, whether it is smuggling or not. It's disturbing, it's disturbing. Uh, I don't think uh, if a man has envisaged that there's going to be scarcity of food mm. and they uh, are taking steps to supply food, to guarantee food security for his uh, family, or if a farmer feels that uh, he wants to make better profit from whatever proceeds come from his farm, and you put those proceeds or uh, products in some silos and storages and all that. I'm not too sure that the law allows you to go and confiscate and commandeer whatever he may have kept for his own uh, wealth and um, born out of his own uh, sweat. You must make a law before you can appropriate or take that away from him. Or you buy it uh, legitimately from him at uh, the prices he sees that those goods or those products or those farm produces are what we should not begin to behave as if we are a law without a constitution without law you know we can just ban some people and the commander and take away whatever belongs to them legitimately. The problem is at hand. Even though looks are very big, there are solutions to them. Very simple solution. If the Nigerian alliance will uh, be committed to ensuring that this bandit that this uh, kidnapping going on all over the places, the rain then ends. 
they stop it because they want to start mining precious mineral resources and selling the international market for their own profit or for their own wealth and all that. Then they can't find solutions to the food crisis because half of the insecurity that we have in the rural areas is due to the fact that certain persons are harming certain people to be able to take over some land and then begin to exploit or mine whatever precious mineral resources like gold, titanium, and lithium, and what have you, are in those places. And look at the weapons that the bandits are, are using. Who has the capacity, who has the ways and means to be able to import and make these kind of weapons available to the kidnappers, to the bandits, and to the Bokwaram they we have all over the places. It's basically the Nigerian ally, not you and I. So if the Nigerian ally are cutting their own losses in order to spy themselves, they should please leave the rest of leave the rest of us alone. They should let us uh, not our wounds and find solutions to our or to the problem that they have imposed on us as a people. Okay. Uh, there's a story that all the newspapers ha uh, carried. Uh, on punch, it is motorists lament poor drainage as flood submerges Lagos roads. On daily trust, uh, is the same thing. Uh, on, um, on the Guardian, rather, NEMA, 151 houses affected by downpour in Lagos. And also on Nature News, which we are concentrating on now. Nature News, 151 houses affected by flood in Lagos. The rider is Lagos flood crisis and North Central's delayed rainfall unveil Nigeria's weather challenges in 2024, according to NEMA. Uh, Lagos State being flooded. Just just one rain or two rains or, you know, the, rain, the, the rainy season has not even come. We are seeing a flood and 151 houses, which is quite a number, have been affected mm. by flood. Well, the truth of the matter is that uh, climate change is real. When you look all over the world, and take a place like Pakistan, that will in the past not experience much rainfall in a year, they are now having massive, massive uh, flooding in those places. When we were also growing up here in Nigeria and northern, the rain was a rarity in the northern part of the country. In fact, I can recollect that sometimes special prayers will be made in the mosque and in the churches and by the traditionally for rain to fall before rain begins to fall in those days. But you see what is happening in the northern part of the country now. We are having floods in those places. So that tells us that um, climate change it's not a joke. It's uh, the obvious. So we as the people must uh, get more prepared for all these um, climate changes by creating artificial canals, channelization, widening some of our roads, and adopting a different methodology of building our houses along the coastal areas and the riverine places and whatever. Most part of Lagos are below the sea level. But our houses built to withstand the challenges of the soil or of an environment that is below the sea level, the answer is no. So there is no way we will not be having floods if our houses are not built to take cognizance of the below the sea level status of a legal state. Most of the canalization that we should also have done in a place like Lagos, for example, they have not been done. So those things have to be revisited. Furthermore, the attitude of our people to dispose of their waste is also blocking the villages. Uh, recently, I think the federal government and the state government have said they want to ban all these plastic uh, containers mm. 
and also the structures they drink because it continue to con uh, constitute very serious uh, environmental hazard. So when those things uh, are used, we merely throw them on the ground. We don't find a way to dispose them um, in such a manner that you will not cause the trilogies and what happens. And you know what? The first time of those things take about a hundred years before they can decay, before they can biograde, before they can um, uh, degenerate and then turn to soil again. A hundred years is a long time. I've also read somewhere that there is no technology yet to really be able mm. to take care or collect right. waste that is generated by all these plastics and uh, and the nylon uh, okay. containers and what happens. Mm. You have to do it uh, manually. So if this is a challenge, you must get prepared uh, uh, for it. Okay. Furthermore, the legal state government used to do massive, massive uh, damages, uh, clearance, and what have you, before the rain starts on a yearly basis. Mm. I understand it's the uh, money uh, uh, consuming or it uh, takes, uh, and you need some resources to be able to do that. I think there's no way out of that. They must continue to ensure that damages are cleaned. Okay. The sands that have caught those damages are cleared out okay. before the rain starts on a yearly basis. All right, Mr. By Kalawale. this way, yeah. we will be finding some solutions. Yeah. Uh, this is where we have to wrap up. Thank you so much for being a part of our program this morning. Uh, we sincerely hope that uh, you can re rejoin us next week for another edition of the program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, my brother. Yeah. Okay, we've been talking to Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos. We'll take a very brief break, and when we return, we'll be treating our first hot topic. Stay with us. <music>